Good morning, and thanks to Tamar and Mark for inviting me again. I think this is a great event for us because it's, it's a great opportunity to connect with colleagues outside of the operating room, outside of the office, uh, even if it's talking about orthopedics on a Saturday morning. So thanks a lot for that. Um, I'm going to be talking about the evolving treatment of shoulder instability. It, it is an area of orthopedics that has evolved a lot over time. It's a very complicated set of conditions and patients, as you can see here. But what I'm going to focus on is the most common type of instability that we as sports medicine docs see in the office, which is acute traumatic anterior dislocations when the ball comes out the front of the joint as a result of trauma. And the reason why this occurs is mostly due to the way the shoulder is designed. First, the socket is relatively flat. The radius of curvature of the socket is greater than the radius of curvature of the relatively round ball. Secondly, the socket only covers about a third of the ball, um, and that, together with the radius of curvature, leaves the shoulder relatively unstable. It's vulnerable to dislocation. It's a good, it's a good thing. It's advantageous because we can position our arm anywhere in space, but it's also one of the joints that's most likely to dislocate. Put simply, it's a very large ball in a very small, shallow dish. And there are certain parts of our anatomy that help confer some additional stability to the joint. First is the concavity of the other structures. So the dish is relatively shallow, that's true, but the joint surface cartilage that covers the socket is not uniform. It's thinner at the center and thicker at the periphery, and that makes the glenoid a little bit more curved and helps it fit a little bit better with the ball. You also have the, the labrum, the soft tissue bumper that runs around the edge of the socket, and that serves to deepen the socket about 50% and increases the contact between ball and socket by as much as 75%. We then have our rotator cuff, the dynamic muscles that cross the joint, and those serve like reins on a horse, helping to pull the ball into the socket. The front rotator cuff and the rear rotator cuff, the subscapularis and the infraspinatus, help to keep that ball centered in the joint, helping to prevent dislocations. And then finally, we have our ligaments. The glenohumeral joint ligaments serve as check reins. When we get into that vulnerable position, those ligaments become taut and they serve as another barrier to dislocation. When somebody does dislocate, there's a very characteristic injury pattern that occurs. The fundamental injury is the tear of the labrum from the rim of the socket. And that serves to, first of all, lose your bumper, but also to lose the connection of the glenohumeral ligaments. And this was first described by Dr. Bankart based on a very small number of patients that he identified and then later repaired and reported his findings. But we've come to learn that these labrum tears occur in almost every shoulder dislocation, particularly in our younger patients. In addition to the labrum tear, though, we're really concerned with the natural history of the condition when we're trying to figure out how best to treat these patients. So what would happen if we left them alone after their first dislocation? And there are a variety of studies on this, but the earliest studies, which are well known, which provide up to 25 years of follow-up, show us that the most important predictor of recurrence, dislocating again after your first dislocation, can be as high as 90% if you're younger than 20 years old. And that's why we tend to approach these patients maybe a little bit more aggressively. When we look at the large body of research that looks at what happens with a first time dislocation, should we treat them with surgery? Should we leave them alone? We sort of synthesize these articles in this Cochrane review. And what this Cochrane review shows us is that Surgery for a first-time dislocation can reduce the risk of recurrence by up to 80%. Outcome scores are in fact improved with surgery. And as many as 50% of patients that are initially left alone will come to require surgery at some point. But not everyone recurs, not everyone needs surgery. And what this review pointed out, which other research has confirmed, is that there's a certain cohort that's vulnerable. And those tend to be younger patients, male patients more than young women, and those that are involved in highly demanding activities like collision sports, for example. So to illustrate sort of a routine dislocation case, this is a young man who sustained his first dislocation while skiing. It popped right back in on its own a year before coming to the doctor. He eventually returned to normal activities and was doing fairly well, but a year later dislocated again after slipping while rock climbing. And this is his MRI. I don't know if you can see the mouse there, but this is the black soft tissue bumper, the labrum, and it's disconnected from the edge of the socket. So he's lost his bumper, 
and he's lost the connection of those important glenohumeral ligaments. So this is a good candidate for an arthroscopic repair. The way we do arthroscopic repair is, is through small portals or cannulas, and we use an instrument to pass high-strength suture around the torn structure. So this is called a suture lasso. We penetrate the tissue with the lasso, and then we use this wire to shuttle this high-strength stitch across the torn structure. We're then going to anchor that stitch and the torn tissue to the edge of the socket with a plastic suture anchor, three millimeters in diameter, and that anchor will affix the, 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 the uh, tissue and the, the uh, suture back to the rim. This is us making a drill hole, and then you'll see the anchor coming in through the same cannula into the glenoid, thus reattaching the labrum, recreating the bumper, and reattaching the ligaments, which are not shown in the model. And we're going to repeat this several times in order to get a solid repair. This is the, the actual patient. We're looking from the back towards the front. He's lying on his side. And you can clearly see here at the edge of the socket, this hyperemic reddened tissue is the torn tissue separated from the glenoid rim and actually a little bit of cartilage damage as well. So we use a series of instruments first to mobilize the tissue and then to prepare the edge of the socket. And this is the final product similar to the animation where we have three anchors, high strength stitches, we've recreated the bumper, and we've reattached his ligaments. And this surgery is an effective operation. Recurrence rates are fairly low, but there are some people who do recur even with a well done surgery. So there's another series of papers that have looked at risk for recurrence after a well done surgery. And there are certain risk factors. Men are more likely to recur than women if you have hyperlaxity, if you're young, the number of dislocations you've had before you have your first operation can predict failure. But the most important predictor of recurrent dislocation after surgery is bone loss. That's clearly a big issue. Well, one of the sort of pioneers of shoulder arthroscopy looked at his own series of arthroscopically repaired shoulders. And what he found is his recurrence rate was as high as 11%, all comers. But when he dove deeper into the data, what he found is there were two groups of patients. There was a group with bone loss and a group without bone loss. The group without bone loss did well, a recurrence rate as low as 4%, which is very good. The group with bone loss had a recurrence rate as high as 67%, which is obviously unacceptable. And he estimated bone loss. If we understand that the socket is usually pear-shaped, it's wider at the base, more narrow at, at the top, he described what we call the inverted pear when the socket narrows at the bottom as a result of bone loss. And that was estimated to represent about 25 to 30% bone loss. And those are the patients that are susceptible to recurrence even after a well-done soft tissue repair. And we can objectively measure bone loss as well on a CAT scan. If we understand that the bottom of the socket is a perfect circle, we draw that perfect circle and we measure the diameter of the, of the bone loss compared to the overall diameter of the perfect circle, that's the percentage of bone loss. Well, what's critical bone loss? A couple of well-known Japanese surgeons looked at what critical bone loss would be. What would increase our risk of recurrence after a well-done surgery? And the number was estimated between 20 and 30% bone loss. Well, like a lot of topics within shoulder instability, this has evolved over time, this concept of critical bone loss. We now know, recent research has pointed out, perhaps 20% is too high. When you look at a term called subcritical bone loss, if you draw the line at 13% more or less, you find that even patients that had 13% bone loss had a higher risk of recurrence even after a well-done arthroscopic repair. And this becomes even more relevant in our high-risk population, our collision athletes. Well, bone loss doesn't only occur on the socket side. You can also get bony involvement on the ball side. When you get a relatively soft ball banging against the firm bone of the glenoid rim during a dislocation, the ball can actually indent slightly, much like a ping pong ball. This is called a hill sacs lesion, and it's also very, very common in almost every dislocation that we see. Small hill sacs lesions, thankfully, are usually irrelevant. We can basically ignore them, but there are certain hill sacs lesions that are important. <coughs> the initial concept was an engaging hill sacs lesion. If you raise your arm into the vulnerable position and that indented portion of the ball was exposed to the glenoid rim, the ball can fall out more easily. And that's an important hill sacs to pay attention to when you're deciding how to treat patients. But again, this concept has evolved over time. We now understand that there's this 
on-track, off-track concept, which is hard for even orthopedic surgeons to understand. But in general, when you move your arm in space, the glenoid socket creates a track or traces a track across the humeral head, like railroad tracks. If the hillsax is small enough where it's not exposed to the track, then it's irrelevant. But if the hillsax lesion is large enough, or if the track is small enough, then the hillsax lesion becomes important. And you can see in this video an off-track hillsax. What this off-track concept is important for is understanding that it's really the combination of issues that become important. It's not either a large hill sax or a large socket defect. Sometimes smaller defects on either side can combine to create a problem and arthroscopic repair won't be successful. Well, here's a case that illustrates the importance of bone loss. So this is a 24-year-old rugby player and he had an initial injury where he felt his quote-unquote shoulder explode but not truly dislocate. He actually went back to playing in that tournament that weekend and ended up getting back to normal activities, but had a recurrent injury several months later where he did truly dislocate, ended up in the emergency room, and then in the orthopedist's office. And this is what his MRI looks like. You see the characteristic labrum tear, but you also see a suggestion of bone loss on the socket. The edge is blunted, much like a broken golf tee. So when we, when we see that there might be bone loss, then we get a CAT scan also. And what this CAT scan shows us in this right panel is that inverted pear shape where there seems to be important bone loss in this patient. And in fact, it was measured to be about 20%. So a 20% bone loss in a young male who plays rugby, soft tissue repair is likely to recur, so he needs a bony procedure. And historically, the bony procedure was iliac crest autograft. We take a piece of bone, often from the patient's own pelvis, and we fix that piece of bone to the edge of the socket with a series of screws. A very effective way to replace bone loss, but it has some limitations. First of all, graft site morbidity. It hurts a lot. Secondly, it doesn't have blood flow, so limited ability to heal. Third of all, it doesn't have any articular cartilage on it, like the joint should have. And finally, it has no dynamic benefit. There's no attached muscles or tendons. So the Ladder J procedure has really replaced the iliac crest as the bone graft treatment of choice. And this uh, animation shows us what the procedure looks like just in terms of the bone. There's this finger-like projection of bone from the shoulder blade called the coracoid. We can harvest that coracoid right next to where we're already working, prepare it by flattening the edge of the bone. We create a couple drill holes in the bone graft and we fix it to the edge of the socket with screws, just like we would have done with iliac crest. And this has become an incredibly powerful tool for addressing these patients with bone loss. It has a couple important advantages as compared to iliac crest. First of all, it doesn't hurt as much as iliac crest. Secondly, because as you can see in the bottom panels, the biceps muscle is still attached, the blood flow is preserved, so it has an improved ability to heal. And finally, when you bring that arm into the vulnerable position, that attached biceps serves as a sling or hammock and provides additional dynamic stability to the joint. So a much better option compared to iliac crest. And this is that rugby player now post-surgical. This is his most recent x-ray showing the bone graft fixed in place with two screws with a congruent joint and a centered humeral head. It's a great operation, and as it has evolved, indications and the way we use it have also expanded. It used to be just for bone loss on the socket side. Now we use it for that off-track combined scenario. Some people use it when there's just a very large hill sax on the ball side. Revision surgery for those patients that have already had a scope and then ended up recurring. And in some areas, in Europe and Japan, for example, it has become the first line treatment for shoulder dislocations in collision athletes, although that certainly is still a bit controversial. Well, here's an, a case that illustrates limitations of the ladder J. This is a patient who had had up to 25 dislocations prior to seeing a doc. You can see from these frontal views that he has a very large hill sax lesion um, on the ball side. Before he was able to seek uh, surgery, he was enlisted in the military, was deployed, and by the time he came back for reevaluation, he had sustained yet another injury. And this time now, his ball is stuck out the front and had been for several weeks. When you get a CT scan, you see the 3D reconstruction shows almost 40% of his socket has worn away. And that's really one of the limitations of the ladder J procedure. It's great for bone loss up to 30%, maybe 35%. But when you have 40% or more, 
There just isn't enough bone on the coracoid to deal with that scenario. And that's where this distal tibia allograft has really come into play. We can use a size matched cadaver graft from the lower end of the patient's tibia and harvest a piece of bone to be used to replace this lost bone. It's kind of a neat procedure because the radius of curvature of the distal tibia actually resembles closely the radius of curvature of your humeral head. You can see the left panels, you're placing the distal tibia up against the ball and they fit pretty well together. You can take bone basically of unlimited size and it has articular cartilage on it. So there are a couple important advantages. And the, this is a video showing harvesting the distal tibia allograft with a micro saw on the back table. And the bottom panel shows that this large bone with cartilage attached to the edge of the socket, just like we do in a Latterge procedure. And then finally, just a post-operative x-ray of a different patient. This patient had had a previous arthroscopy, sustained a re-injury with a fracture of the socket through previous anchor holes, and he had about 35% loss of glenoid bone, another good candidate for distal tibia. And the right panel shows the large piece of distal tibia graft fixed with screws with a congruent arc and a centered humeral head. So our treatment of shoulder instability continues to evolve. Past controversies continue to percolate. We still debate how to treat first-time dislocators. Present controversies are still relevant. We continue to debate who's a candidate for bone versus soft tissue repair. You can see from the off-track concept and subcritical bone loss. And the future is at our doorstep. We're perfecting now techniques to do bony reconstruction with the arthroscopic approach, which at some point will become the standard of care. Thanks a lot.